plugging in here. So all right, we'll start. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar on customs verifications and audits. Uh, the catchy uh, sideline, uh, what you're going to do when they come for you. I thought um, we could play some bad boys music, uh, but um, I've spared you the experience. Um, with me is uh, Dave Pentland, a co-host. Uh, my name is Dan Kisselback, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, provide a few pointers on how to manage a verification and audit and discuss some examples. Uh, I want to mention at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, we're going to do a survey, uh, provide you with the opportunity to do a survey. It's going to appear in the chat, apparently, uh, and um, it would uh, be uh, nice if you could complete that um, outline uh, so that we can tailor our content to uh, provide uh, uh, you with uh, what um, you would like to see in the next uh, quarter, uh, next couple quarters. Next slide. So, disclaimer that this is only information, it's not legal advice, and uh, if you need uh, advice of any sort, uh, contact a qualified uh, professional. Next, please. And Dave uh, Carson, uh, International VP, many years of experience, uh, customs verifications and audits, licensed in Canada and the US, and uh, much experience of verifications on both sides of the border. Dave, you wanna say anything more about yourself? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> welcome um, uh, to the session and a pleasure joining you again, Dan. And um, yeah, looking forward to uh, customs verifications. Uh, I, I've done a few of these uh, in the past uh, sessions and I, I, I tend to always uh, um, have the catchy phrase, looking forward to a customs audit. So, uh, um, and hopefully by the end of this, we'll kind of explain uh, my catchy phrase on that. So I'll turn it back to you, to, Dan, to kick it off. So. All right, so uh, I, uh, for folks that who don't know me, you have 30 years of experience, over 30 years of experience, licensed in Ontario, BC, and New York, uh, have the experience with uh, verifications and audits on both sides of the border, um, audits, collections, negotiations, planning, litigation, anything to do with trade and customs. And uh, I was explaining to Dave that I'm now completing the Queens Cornell Executive MBA program. Dave's well ahead of me. He finished uh, many years ago in his MBA. So I want to be like you, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should have done it when you were younger. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, this is our kind of, I guess, uh, theme uh, photo. Uh, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And if your goal is to avoid the consequences of failing a verification audit, investing in compliance makes business sense, good business sense. Um, there's no need to be tortured with questions, surprise assessments, unwanted attention, all these bad things that can happen if you fail an audit uh, or a verification. And the best way to achieve this goal is to develop a compliance plan. Uh, compliance doesn't have to be hard. Um, there are uh, uh, industry standard due diligence tools and their application can minimize risks. Dave? Yeah, and I, my, my one comment would be uh, in this day and age with technology, it's not a matter of if a customs audit takes place. It's just a matter of when it will take place. And so uh, it's just eventually your number will come up. You haven't done anything. You haven't been offside. It's just it's your turn, and um, and that's what I talk about. Looking forward to custom audit, because if you're if you have your systems in place, and hopefully we give you a few tools and benchmarks to work with uh, today, um, then you actually look forward to it. Because once you go through a successful customs audit, then you go from a gray group of people that uh, customs knows nothing about. Uh, to a group that you've uh, you've been vetted, and they're going to go and work with some people that maybe maybe don't don't have systems in place, and um, and they'll concentrate on them, and they'll leave you alone, and you get back to business. So yeah. So next slide, please. Uh, there's various types, and I, I we've just mentioned a few here: um, single program, multi program, transaction line re review, duties relief, control of goods, marking and labeling. Um, Many are tailored to the type of industry. And I, I remember dealing with uh, duty-free stores, defense production, food importers, trade compliance uh, programs, uh, uh, you know, to deal with um, what you might be facing. 
uh, with the uh, CBP or the CBSA should be tailored to what you do, what the business model is and what, um, what the business is. So uh, defining what the business needs to do um, is shaped by what the business model is. David, any comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's a great um, uh, segue is that really everything should be tailored to what you do as a business. Don't try and take somebody else's uh, um, uh, systems that's in a food industry when you're in uh, garments. I mean, it should needs to be tailored to your specific industry. So. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, there, 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 there is stuff that is around that can make uh, this job easier. And uh, what we generally do is we understand, you know, is it importing only or exporting only or importing and exporting? What is the kind of industry? Is it in petroleum or is it uh, exporting, you know, um, goods that are could be caught on the guide for Canada's export controls? And then we drill into what are the, um, what are the compliance requirements? Uh, so next slide, please. So this one, Dan, maybe I can just kick this one off a little bit. Most things we're talking about today are with CBSA or Canada Customs. However, CBP or U.S. Customs in the States, some of their timelines are a little different, but overall, um, you need some sort of system in place to make sure that you've got uh, an audit proof system um, so that you can stand up with a classification. This uh, eye chart here is actually CBSA or Canada Customs target list for 2022. They uh, are one step ahead of CBP in the States where they actually publish and they feel that it's uh, worth letting the trades, specifically the brokers and the brokers through to their clients, a list of what they're targeting. CBP does not uh, do the same thing. They, they decide to uh, just surprise people. So on this list is things, and if you see round two or round four, those are items that they're, they've already uh, been on there for one year and that there's still issues they're trying to resolve. So they're, they're on a second round. So um, Dan's been heavily involved in uh, uh, the chicken or spent fowl ones. Uh, we've been heavily involved in some garment uh, classifications. You see footwear has been on there for two rounds. Apparel industry, this is their fourth year in a row that they're still on there. And the big one that you should look at is that origin right now, even though that uh, we're in the uh, um, fourth year of the new NAFTA or the USMCA, there's no pending origin reviews right now that are being uh, taken place by a CBSA. So that's all I'm going to talk about that. That list, if you see, if you're an industry that's in that list, you probably have already been approached by CBSA. If you haven't, you're probably on the cusp of being approached by them because these are broad based and they, they go after everybody based on their importer number and they have all your statistics. They don't need to come to you to ask for your import uh, levels. So, Yeah. Just a couple comments here. Uh, I think both sides of the border have what is known uh, as uh, targeted verification priorities. Some are disclosed by the CBSA. Uh, CBP doesn't. Uh, it's determined on a risk basis, uh, risk analysis, uh, and um, new targets are added throughout the year. Uh, priorities may be carried over from the previous year, and there may be additionally just random verifications designed to promote voluntary compliance. So um, you've got a system that targets certain areas, and then there's a kind of a random number generator or whatever they do to, uh, to uh, target people. Next, uh, please. So, uh, again, I guess, uh, David, uh, the theme is, uh, um, you know, preparation, single program verifications, in my experience, at least generally, uh, last a year, it expands a calendar year. Uh, there's several policy statements. Uh, for example, there's one that d deals with general origin procedures. There's a gen there's a tariff, uh, or trade compliance verification manual that can tell uh, folks uh, or advisors, you know, what's the playbook from the CBSA standpoint, what the, uh, the uh, trade compliance verification officer should be doing. Um, there is a, 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 a policy dealing with self adjustments, how far you need to go back and, uh, ordinarily under the law. There is a four year correction period, uh, but there is a reassessment policy, which governs when a shorter period may apply. So it's kind of nice to know, um, you know, what, what the, um, what your rights are, uh, if you are, um, in the uh, crosshairs of a verification audit 
and uh, the policy can give some guidance. David? Um, and, and on that topic, I mean, one uh, positive thing is, is that um, the four year time limit on corrections was uh, for almost all the programs other than NAFTA. And one of the positive things that came out of when they renewed NAFTA and it became the US uh, MCA is that uh, in, in the past NAFTA review was one year where you could go back and ask for, for duty you can now go back four years, which is, which was a big, big change. So that's um, my one comment on that. So. Next, please. Preparation. Um, there are industry standard ways for preparation. Uh, main elements are processes and written procedures. Uh, they describe uh, business activities in key trade areas for the business. Uh, classification, valuation, origin, special trade programs, record keeping, GST, corrections, adjustments, royalties, distribution agreements, pricing agreements, etc. So, uh, when you're doing a um, manual or uh, a system uh, to inform uh, the trade compliance folks within your business, uh, it's nice to have the categories uh, that uh, are applicable to your business and have it recorded so that um, you have this information um, which uh, shows how the business model operates. It makes it easier to answer questions. It shows intended due diligence if the CBSA or the CVP uh, have questions or come knocking. And uh, it maintains corporate knowledge if staff leave or if there's a reorganization. David? Uh, yeah, my one comment was at, at the end of this presentation, there's a slide that kind of puts in a pictorial setting where you can actually see the flow of a lot of people, if they haven't been through an audit, um, believe that it's just providing the invoice to customs and customs says, well, that's the invoice that looks great. That's what you paid on and a conversation. They're actually looking for the linkage between um, your systems and methodologies for how you account for goods and how you pay for things. So at the end of this, um, I'll talk more about a slide that I've been using for probably 20 years, and it's still relevant today as it was 20 years ago. So. An oldie but a goodie. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, here we're talking about managing uh, verification or an audit, and uh, the point here is build a team. Uh, there's uh, three main concerns that I see uh, when I get called. It's often, uh, you know, when a verification letter or an audit uh, inquiry has been made. And um, the concerns that pop up uh, uh, really relate to failures in one of three areas. The uh, assignment of resources, understanding the risks, and making prompt responses. Um, if a failure in one of these areas can really antagonize the customs verification or audit officer, and um, that's a, something you want to avoid, antagonizing the officer. David? Yeah, my, my comment would be is that um, um, take these serious. And the very first thing is if you get a letter um, that you've been selected, right away give your customs broker a call. And take a look, and Dan's talking about risk analysis, you can run reports to go back in time to see what's at risk and what you're looking at and the potential. And if your broker needs additional resources, they'd reach out to someone like Dan and his, his team. Um, because there's sometimes when there's additional zeros at risk, um, it may sound like a very slow start to a little um, investigation, but you may be on to bigger issues. And, and, and so I think it's really risk analysis, the very first thing you should do, and, uh, and call your broker. You know, very First and foremost, call them, tell them you've received the letter. Because at that point in time, your customs broker is unaware of any kind of um, re reply that's gone between CBSA and you as the importer. So. Next, please. <clears throat> So if we talk about um, or have talked about building a team, it's also important to build a playbook and uh, it's necessary to assign a lead. Somebody that's going to be the spokesperson for the business, either internal or external and know the scope of the verification and keep it confined to that verification. It should not be a kind of a fishing expedition for the government. Uh, when I say verification, also audit uh, the, the same pr principles uh, apply. 
So um, the uh, other thing that I wanted to mention is know what the business's, uh, I'll say, filing position is. Uh, what is the position of the um, of the business with respect to the declarations that have been made, especially with uh, respect to uh, valuation, origin, classification, and also whether or not permits apply or other compliance issues. It's important to have that uh, information at hand and, and ready to go uh, in case somebody wants to uh, know answers to questions related to that. David? Yeah, and and it, again, the assign a lead to be the spokesperson, that, that should be the person that's most informed uh, within your company. Um, customs quite often will say, is there somebody else we could speak to? You may, uh, you know, think that this is a way to uh, have customs talk to somebody else within the company. They may not understand the whole breadth of the, uh, the, uh, of the audit. And, and so first and foremost, you need a lead person. Um, don't let customs decide to pick and choose to talk to somebody in accounting, somebody in receiving. You should always have a lead person that all the information goes in through. Um, that's very, very important. So, Next, please. Issues. Uh, so uh, the common ones we've uh, mentioned already, classification, value, and origin. Uh, with respect to valuation, the, uh, the transaction value method seems to be the most hotly contested because it's the primary method, I guess. And which price counts for valuation purposes seems to be the main issue. For planning purposes, it's important to keep in mind the legislation and the policies. And I see this particularly with respect to uh, non-resident importers, there is the legislation and then there's an overlay of the policies and sometimes the policies can extend or appear to extend the legislation. Now, is that right? Some would argue, you know, the policy should not be uh, considered le legislation. They're only guidance to the officers and so forth. And um, my answer to that is uh, you can be right or you can be happy. And uh, if, if you want to be happy, you should try to comply with both the legislation and the policy. David? Yeah, um, I mean, that's pretty well said. It's, it's a complex area. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I would just say on any time valuation is involved, um, you need assistance. So, Next slide, please. So uh, basic, basic stuff, transaction value uh, method elements, there has to be a sale for export to a purchaser in Canada and a price paid or payable. And these are things that are defined terms. Uh, and there's uh, frequent de uh, debates ab uh, about uh, such things as whether or not there's a, a purchaser in Canada. Um, and, um, you know, you can be a purchaser in Canada if you, if, uh, if, uh, if you fit within uh, certain regulations. Uh, but you've got to make sure that you um, you've done the homework to make sure, if especially if you're not um, uh, a resident, um, to 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 ensure that you fit within the box. And uh, a slip up can be very costly. So there's uh, frequent debates about uh, these things. Uh, primarily, I think because there's money to be had on the part of the government if um, they can count the uh, customer price in Canada rather than the lower supply. Uh, cost uh, and price outside of Canada. David? Yeah, and I guess my comment would be, um, and, th and this is where it gets into gray area on policy is somebody may have been uh, pushed as far as uh, being forced to use a customer price instead of a supply price, and they haven't uh, tried to defend that and customs goes along with it. That set, kind of sets the tone and, and that's when we get into issues where um, we have clients that want to defend their supply price and legally they're allowed to and quite often we bring Dan and his team in because there's a, a number of zeros at work and often they're successful but there's no um, um, there's nothing that uh, prevents CBSA uh, from further going after other companies that won't defend that position um, so it, it's something that uh, I wrestle with as a broker that, uh, you know, I think that everybody should be um, uh, viewed in the same light, but unfortunately, it's, it doesn't always uh, happen. So, 
Um, yeah, you, you, you sometimes get officers, at least in the olden days, that would say that they'll they'll just you know assess uh, an issue of DAS and run the numbers up basically, and then let you appeal. And if you want to appeal, then you can try to knock them down. Uh, so I don't know how prevalent that attitude is nowadays, but uh, that used to be uh, what I was told. So on to the next one. Uh, so again, with the transaction value uh, method, the primary method, uh, section 48 of the Customs Act in Canada, uh, the supply price uh, counts when the importer is a resident, has a permanent establishment, or has imported goods on speculation of sale or own use. And there's a valuation for goods uh, uh, regulations that deals with this. Um, and here we have an example of an importer imports goods on the basis of expressions of interest. Um, has title, insures goods against the risk of loss, books them as inventory and warehouses them in Canada. So maybe a U.S. company that uh, imports, uh, makes the goods available for inspection and delivers them on uh, uh, from the warehouse uh, to the customers in Canada. And uh, it takes the position that the goods are imported on speculation of sale, um, their inventory, and they should be valued on the, on the basis of the supply cost. This is a very typical situation that we've seen time over time. And sometimes as the CBSA officer, the verification officer takes issue with it. And then we have to kind of go through the education process. David. Um, I, th I think that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and you and I have dealt with that so many, so many times. So. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, Again, uh, uh, basic principles, the price paid or payable includes all payments made directly and indirectly in respect of goods. And there's a, a definition uh, uh, provision within uh, the legislation. And uh, there's certain adjustments that have to be made. You start off with the invoice price and then you have to include or deduct out certain uh, elements in order to come up with the customs price. And um, it's kind of nice to have that done before your uh, verification or audit occurs, rather than be scrambling later on to figure out if you've done it right. In an ideal situation, you wouldn't have to do that. Uh, but I do see that uh, quite frequently where people kind of go backwards and they re-engineer what they've done. And, and sometimes they've overpaid, right? And we, we, we were able to get a refund. Uh, and sometimes they've underpaid and, and, and that's a more problematic issue. So here again, an apparel company, kind of a, a typical example, what we see, uh, the importer's general ledger shows that the importers paid royalties. Uh, the royalties are paid under an unwritten royalty agreement. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember at the time, there was a policy that if there's an unwritten royalty agreement, you had to have a, a written royalty agreement, otherwise they would include it in the value for duty. So uh, the officer proposes to include them in the value for duty. The importer provides an, uh, an affidavit on the advice of counsel uh, that the royalties were not paid in respect of goods. If they're not paid in respect of the goods, they shouldn't be you know, included in the valuation. And uh, ultimately the verification officer agrees that the royalty should not be included. So that's a kind of a typical scenario with respect to adjustments that we've seen. David? Yeah, I would say anything that's to do with adjustments or deductions, um, anything like that, have it in writing. Um, uh, it, uh, Customs is always skeptical that you intended to have it in writing. It's just um, you didn't have it in writing. So um, it's it's a great point that unwritten royalty agreements really don't work. Um, um, and the same with commissions. You need to have them documented. If you need assistance, just reach out and ask people for help on those. But, uh, um, yeah, a lot of people think it's just a matter of they'll get to uh, uh, put the documents together once the audit takes place, but it's all much, much easier if you've got them ahead of time. You know, it, 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 you can have a contract in writing, orally, or by conduct, but the CBSA and like, you know, the, the other officer, CBP, like to have things in, in writing for purposes of proof, right? Definitely. And, uh, so, so that's not uh, a place where you need to be is, is having unwritten stuff. Next, please. Classification, another key verification issue 
And uh, quite often it involves, uh, in my experience, uh, with respect to goods that are classified as duty free, but then um, the verification officer finds an alternative classification that's dutiable. And sometimes it's a dutiable classification which involves a penal rate of duty. Uh, for example, with respect to supply managed goods, chicken, dairy, uh, and other types of um, goods that are, are, are managed, and there's a tariff rate quota so that you can bring in a certain amount under a permit at a low rate, and then anything beyond that without a permit is uh, at a penal rate, like 300%. So here's a, here's a situation where uh, we've dealt with um, um, a supply managed classification issue. Uh, the verification of the importer involved um, spent foul, which is on the list of uh, uh, priorities. The importer manufactured goods from broiled broiler chicken as, uh, that was determined as a result of the verification. Uh, the tariff rate quota applied to broiler chicken not imported under a permit. So you're looking at, you know, in the range of 300% and an application is made for a supplemental retroactive import permit. So. You can get a retroactive import permit in some situations, but it's, I would call it a, it's a Herculean task. It's very difficult. And uh, we have got them uh, on occasion, but it's not what you want to be doing, right? It's nice to have the permit. David? Um, yeah, just, I mean, that, that's a great example where um, tariff classifications, um, Unfortunately, as a broker, sometimes you get into uh, somebody would like to use a duty free classification, but as a broker knows, you know, there, there's certain rules and regulations that are in place and you can't always just bend over and say, just let's use that classification you've dug up because it's duty free. Those are the low hanging fruit that customs looks for. Um, and it's very easy for them to go in and, and I don't think a broker is doing their job if they're not, um, telling bad news to import that yes you need to pay six percent duty and you can't get a permit on on uh, uh, in this case because there are some huge penalties as far as some of the duties especially in the supply chain managed like Dan said with uh, any of the um, uh, dairy and cheese and chickens turkey things like that um, it's not just not a doubling a duty it goes from a couple percent to in Dan's case in this case 300 percent so yeah, so we've seen cases where 40, $45 million worth of duty is assessed. And right. that, that, you know, it, it can ruin your whole day. So on to the next slide. Verifications and audits origin. So origin, Dave mentioned, uh, you know, they're not really picking on origin right now under the USMCA or uh, COSMA, Canada, US, uh, Mexico agreement. Um, but I will um, bet your bippy that it, they will. Uh, the um, NAFTA agreement at one point, they were looking at it uh, after uh, NAFTA was implemented. And there was some suggestion that up to 50% of the NAFTA cer certifications were bogus or, you know, incorrect. So it's, I think it's just a matter of time uh, until they do. So um, we have dealt with it uh, on the other side of the border in, in the US. Uh, verification of um, of um, NAFTA eligibility, or uh, yeah, yeah, it was NAFTA eligibility, it wasn't uh, USMCA, and um, so the uh, export scenario in this situation is outlined here. The manufacturer, Canadian manufacturer, and Canadian exporter obtains inputs from a Canadian supplier. The supplier represents in a certification that the inputs are NAFTA eligible, provides a NAFTA certificate of origin. The manufacturer and the exporter uses the inputs in the manufacturing of finished goods and then exports them to the U.S. and claims NAFTA treatment. So far, that's so great. But then the U.S. CBP denies the NAFTA claim and carries out a supplier audit and um, determines that uh, it's, um, you know, not eligible. We haven't gotten to uh, the bad stuff. Uh, it, then the um, manufacturer and the exporter uh, may have a claim against the supplier for providing a representation that turns out to be incorrect and uh, leads to a duty assessment. So another example of where planning and preparation is good, not only from the exporter or importer's standpoint, but from a supplier standpoint.
David? Yeah, and I would just say right now, it's a calm before the storm. I, I think we're in a lull right now. There's enough other issues going on, both with CBP and CBSA. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before they there's an uptick on reviewing the USMCA claims. Um, so it, it it's going to, there'll be a time of reckoning. I think the onus is on either the, both the uh, the importer, uh, whoever's the importer record, to do yeah. some due diligence to ensure that they're just not asking for a USMCA certificate. They're actually asking for one that's been vetted, and that the goods actually do qualify. Because as you're, if you're the importer record, um, the pain is going to be on your side if, if in fact the goods do not qualify. And the other way of doing it, one one is to do the review to make sure somebody, a third party, can do a review and say, yeah, we've taken a look at it. It qualifies. These certificates are good. The other way of doing it is to have an indemnity, and and, and I've seen that in uh, supply agreements where the supplier agrees to indemnify the the uh, the exporter importer. Uh, from any liability, if it turns out that the uh, certificate of origin is incorrect. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I guess my only comment, Dan, is that those indemnities only seem to be Canadian Tire uh, wants an indemnity versus a, a vendor versus ABC company is asking a large vendor, they'll just say, you won't buy my goods. So absolutely. Uh, 100%. Yeah. 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 It's all a matter of uh, bargaining power. Right. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Duty deferral, another issue that we've uh, seen uh, uh, not unfrequently. Um, here we have an example of a cheese manufacturer. Um, there's a verification. Uh, the cheese manufacturer imports uh, U.S. dairy products uh, as inputs. It manufactures the cheese in Canada, and then it exports it out of the country back to the U.S. Um, duty deferral is permitted. It's uh, uh, under a license where the... Um, importer complies with uh, program requirements and the uh, cheese manufacturers import manufacturer and export records verify compliance and compliance and support the duty deferral so again record keeping and planning to welcome an audit in the, in uh, dave's parlance uh, is vital uh, because this can get complicated real quick david yeah my comment the good thing about these is most of these are done on permits and applying for special permission to do the manufacturing. So most um, manufacturers that have some sort of duty deferral seem to have uh, pretty good systems in place. So I, I would say this, most people don't run, run offside. However, the caveat is, is that when they do, there's big dollars involved. Um, so, um, yeah. but yeah, planning again is the key. So. Yeah, I, I remember doing one for duty free store and they were releasing the goods before, um, well, they were letting the goods out of the warehouse before there was a customs release. And that was uh, not a good thing. So sometimes there's a disconnect between the compliance requirements and what's actually happening operationally. On to the next slide, please. Verification audits, what's the consequences of failing an audit? Well, you have to correct the incorrect declarations if the CBP or the CBSA um, get a hold of this. Uh, there's an assessment for duties and taxes, possibly uh, penalties, including administrative monetary penalties, uh, potentially seizure and forfeiture in egregious cases involving non-report. Um, you know, I've seen situations where uh, goods have left uh, a uh, sufferance warehouse bulk storage place on trains uh, without having them being reported. Uh, so you don't want to have that situation. Uh, criminal sanctions for intentional non-compliance, interest assessments, collections proceedings, requirements to pay. So the government can go ahead and garnish um, uh, accounts receivable that um, are uh, payments that uh, would be made to uh, the importer. Uh, and they can say, please pay us instead of the, the, the business. Uh, increased border security, so you're going to have pickups at the border. And in the United States, they reserve the right to prevent someone from importing into Canada, uh, into the United States afterwards, uh, after there's a non-compliance issue, so an embargo. Uh, it is important to remember that uh, many of these types of decisions can be appealed if they're done so in a timely way. David? 
Yeah, my my comment would be, you know, I what I tell um, owners or presidents or VPs of companies when they say, you know, this I've got a compliance person here, but they want to spend all this money and time and and effort to make sure things are on site. Is it really worth it? And my my comment to them is always, Canada Customs and U.S. Customs these are monopolies. If you fall on the wrong side of either one of them. There's no other way for you to get your goods within those countries and you become a target. So if it's important for you to have seamless crossing of your goods into Canada or the United States, then yes, um, it's, it's important to make sure that you're compliant and you spend some money internally uh, and make sure everything's on side. So yes, you know, um, cause sometimes uh, unfortunately, uh, the people that are tasked with running the um, senior levels of businesses are usually looking at risk analysis and and uh, if what if happens scenarios and and unfortunately when you're dealing with these monopolies you can't go anywhere else um, so it is definitely worth spending the time resources and money to make sure you have a compliance program in place. One thing I didn't mention here, and I, I, I thought it, I might, is is uh, I've seen also um, reorganizations or acquisitions, and when a um, acquirer goes uh, and and it says to the target, "Hey, we want to buy your business," they'll do their due diligence and they'll want to know where there's risk, and one of the areas is taxes and customs and compliance and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to be able to sell your business. It's kind of nice to be able to say we've got a compliance program, we've had it for a while, uh, and we are a, as far as we know, a, a good compliant uh, firm. So there's an additional business reason to have that in place. Next slide, please. Risk minimization. Uh, one of the tools in the tool uh, uh, chest is self reviews. Um, assessing risk and uh, doing spot duty recovery opportunities uh, when you know you can find duty. Uh, we uh, put here a, an example of a Swedish apparel company. It exported goods uh, to um, uh, Canada. It sought advice with respect to valuation. Turned out it's overpaying duty, uh, and uh, because of the way that it structured the um, the supply chain. And the advice that we gave uh, led to a new method of reducing duties and, and, and costs going forward. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it is not uncommon where we find opportunities to save quite a bit of money. David? Yeah, and the, and the self reviews, it, it doesn't have to be a comprehensive review. It's, it could be as simple as every year taking 10, 15 of your customs entries and actually look at them and dig deeper in and see that everything's on side and then document it, put it aside. And then that's when I'm getting back to welcoming customs audit. So if customs auditors come in either CBP or CBSA and ask, they, you know, uh, send you the letter that you won uh, the lottery and that they're going to come and review um, either on a tariff or valuation origin, um, tell them that you have a program in place, be proud, show them what you have and document where you found errors, you've corrected them and you have programs in place because right then you'll have them understand that they're preaching to the converted and that you have something in place already. And it often turns, goes from being possibly an on-site customs audit where you have auditors on your premises to a desk review that's done quite quickly because they understand you have something in place. So uh, self-reviews are, are really worthwhile. Next, please. Uh, oil and gas company, another example uh, where we were approached uh, by a company that imports and exports petroleum co uh, products into Canada and the US. It's a high volume business, a lot of uh, uh, numbers uh, behind it. Um, issues respecting how the petroleum product inputs should be classified and whether finished goods should be NAFTA eligible. Um, the advice uh, that we provided confirmed the classification and the NAFTA eligibility. So it's a bit of a, you know, uh, safety uh, and risk, uh, risk uh, minimization uh, approach uh, targeted to a particular complex classification issues where a, a mistake could lead to um, um, unwanted attention and unwanted assessments. 
Yeah, I have no <clears throat> no comments at all. That's the one you were involved with, uh, Dan. So yeah. Next, please. So the playbook. It's nice to have a playbook if you're getting into this game. Um, and uh, I have listed out a few elements here. Uh, minimize risk through planning, reviews, uh, rulings, opinions, and there's other means of, of approaching the government on an informal basis. Good records are essential. Procedures, calculations, methods, um, uh, and so forth. Uh, set the uh, tone for the trade compliance folks within the business it also provides continuity corporate knowledge uh, going forward when and if the the officers uh, come and come knocking uh, timely responses are vital uh, even if you're going to be late it, it keep this the officers updated you know we're, we're running a little bit behind uh, we'll uh, you know we need a little bit more time or we're you know what whatever it is but uh, keep the communication lines open appoint a lead spokesperson uh, that um, can develop a good rapport with the officer who's tasked with this job. It's uh, important to kind of set the tone right at the beginning uh, that you're uh, cooperating and collaborating with the, the officer to get this job done. Seek advice on tricky questions. And sometimes the, the tendency is to try to be helpful or try to get the job done quickly. And um, as Wyatt Earp once said, uh, fast is good, but accuracy is everything. So it's nice to be accurate and uh, take your time to answer questions properly and uh, provide written responses to tricky questions. It's, um, it leads to uh, better communication and avoids the innocent misunderstandings. And as I've mentioned, know the filing position, know the position that the business is going to take with respect to its past declarations and declarations going forward so that then you can um, advance uh, that position with the, the officer. David? Yeah, the only thing I would add on that would just be doing, if you did your own self-assessment review on a yearly basis, I'd add that to the list. And under timely responses, um, over and over, um, you know, we get pulled in because somebody says we got a letter from customs that said they're doing an audit and they ask for these books and records and we get it because it's, uh, they're calling me on Thursday and it's due on Friday. Time is of the essence. If you need more time, tell customs up front that you're in holiday period, they're, you, you've lost people, they're working from home on COVID, whatever it is, tell them right up front and they'll grant you more time. If you get closer to the deadline, it just looks like you've delayed it and haven't done anything to that deadline. So ask for lead time up front. They'll always grant it. Um, I, I've never had an instance where they haven't granted other than if you've asked for um, uh, a further renewal and you, you, it looks like you're just stalling because you, you're not spending the time on it. Um, but most times um, just ask for lead time and, and ask for advice quickly don't wait to the last minute so all right next uh, please so no. this no. one i kind of want to walk through because the origins of this go back to um, a golfing buddy of mine who was in charge of customs for british columbia and uh, at that time the yukon territories and he was tasked with and i'm going to tell a few things that maybe aren't politically correct from cbsa's playbook but he said that um, CBSA is a unionized organization and quite often they have people apply to become auditors who um, don't have a lot of financial backgrounds and because of seniority, they have to take them in and train them as auditors. So he went to his training crew and said, I need a graphic to show our auditors what they need to go and look for when they're in an audit. And this graph was developed from from this scenario, and I still believe they use it today. So I, he gave it to me. I've I've been using it. It I, it's been embarrassed a few times where I've sat in meetings with Fortune 500 companies who are really proud to show customs this graph that this is what they're doing, and the auditors are kind of looking at it because it's from their training playbook, and they're kind of wondering how they ever got it. However, it it does show that in the auditor's mind, everything starts with a purchase order. So when they do a review, they're going to be looking at your purchase order and they're looking for linkages. 
And in this case, we're talking about four widgets. So it's just four widgets. They look at a purchase order. This is the price you agreed to buy it at. Uh, it was invoiced at that price. It arrived on a way bill. There was a customs uh, entry done for four widgets. It agreed upon price. You received the goods. You paid for the goods. And it's in your journal, ledger, sub-ledger, and journals. And so that's what they're looking for. And, and the auditors, when they go in, if there's anything that deviates out of that process, that's what they go looking for. Because there's, you know, in our case, the purchase order said they wanted to buy four. The invoice was for five. One got short shipped. The custom entry didn't have the right declaration. So they're looking for any discrepancies. But it's just not one piece of uh, documentation they're looking for. They're looking for a linkage that ties everything together that they can leave and say, that that's the price they agreed to, that's the price was paid, and there's no uh, additions or deductions, or if there was, they've been accounted for. So I've been using it for 20 plus years. I continue to use it. I should update it one of these days. It, it has an old logo from our company from probably 20 years ago on the bottom left, but it's still current today as it was 20 years ago. And, it, and it's the one thing that I think you should take away um, when you have a customs review is that this is what CBSA or CBP is looking for. So That's really great, David. And it does uh, illustrate the fact that uh, compliance doesn't have to be hard, right? You just have to have it planned out. And if you can do these things that, um, that uh, you're setting out here uh, together with the customs broker, uh, that will stand you in great stead. So uh, onto the next slide, please. So this is a favorite quote I have. If you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else by Yogi Berra. And uh, that's kind of the message that I wanted to uh, leave you with is uh, know where you're going uh, so that you uh, can uh, get to the place where you want to be, which is the completion of an audit without being tortured with a bunch of questions uh, endlessly or site visits. And, um, and 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 pass the audit. Um, I, I think that uh, Gus mentioned that there is going to be a survey. Uh, I haven't seen it pop up here, but uh, if you do get the survey, uh, I would ask uh, that you complete it so that we can provide uh, more of these types of um, of uh, sessions that uh, are tailored towards uh, what you're looking for, uh, and. Um, or send uh, David or I an email, and uh, that would be very helpful as well. David? Yeah, I just want to thank you for your attending today, and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me or myself or Dan. And Dan, thanks again for your, your fine uh, tutelage, and uh, talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks very much, folks, and uh, I want to wish you uh, all the best for the rest of the day. Okay. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.